Welcome to the Fuel Move Recover podcast. This show is a complement to the content found at advancingathletics.com. We welcome you into the FMR family, but remember the topics we discuss are not clinical recommendations or medical advice. Howdy, everyone. Welcome to the Fuel Move Recover pod. Hold on. First of all, it's just so exciting that we have a podcast now. This is like number, <laughs> number six. You know, I just can't get over it. My name is Michele Iono. I'm joined by my teammates, Alex Suiting. Hi. And Lindsay Malone. Hello. So this is our podcast. Well, I guess you guys all know that, right? So this is the thing that we do that complements the work that you find on fuelmoverecover.com. So we're going to be talking about the article that Alex wrote, and that's what we do every week. And then we sprinkle in you random stuff, hopefully for your information and entertainment. So, or hopefully it's informative and entertaining. As hopefully you're starting to learn that we take it serious, that you guys feel like you're part of our lives. You know, that's what real friends do or real family does. With that being said, let's go around the virtual room, I guess, and see how everybody's doing. So Alex, um, you drinking anything? How's your day going? Yeah, my day's going well. So I've got the greatest friends in the world and I have a rotating like open door policy to any of my friends. And so one of my friends last week drove up from Missouri just randomly and surprised me. Um, So I'm drinking. She drove? She drove. Um, So she drove 18 hours to spend the week (laughs) Um, because she's the best. So um, she brought beer from one of my favorite breweries in St. Louis. So I'm drinking a raspberry Heppenweizen from Schlafly Brewery. Um, so today was good. Worked a little. We hung out. Um, it was a nice day. So just, Is she still there? Just to enjoy. She's still here. So she's here through the rest of the week. Oh my so gosh. Should be Until when? Through the rest of the week. It's open-ended kind August. of. She's between contract yeah. for her job right now. So she has a little flexibility. Uh, she, is she a, an assassin or... <laughs> <laughs> she's a nurse so she's badass for sure so yeah okay well that counts still That's yeah still awesome cool how was your day Lindsay? oh it was good i um i did some work this morning and then um p- picked everyone up we went to the pool for a little while and uh that was it really but it's an, a nice day but very warm so um we got out for a walk like later in the day and it's finally like gotten cool. So yeah, good day. I'm drinking new juice IPA Southern tier. I don't know. Mm. You guys are fans of Southern tier. It's a brewery and not as much as you are. I know. I love it. It's like, literally like my favorite. I don't think they make anything bad. Um, so yeah, good. I'm like relaxed now. So that's good. <laughs> Cool. What about you, Michaela? Yeah, how, what are you drinking? How was your day? So when we were on Outer Banks, we always stop at this one huge farmer's market called Morris's. The brewery, so they started their own brewery because everybody has brewery now. That's what we'll start next. The, the, <laughs> the you know, I mean, it only goes in line with the whole fuel thing. So, but, um, so, <laughs> so this is from, they named it Mother Earth. So it's like super crunchy. And it's called the Weeping Willow Wit. And like the entire brewery only uses solar energy and all renewable like goods and like all this kind of, all that kind of, um, you know, super green kind of stuff that I just adore. And my day was good. I've, um, I work, I see clients out of a gym nearby. And uh, thankfully, I have a really good relationship with them. And you, the listener, might see some of their logos, Route 250 Health and Performance, on some of our YouTube videos that we have done and will be doing in the future. But thankfully, I uh, have a good relationship with them, and I have space there. I can go and work there because we're still doing renovations on the house, and there wasn't power for most of the day here. So I was able to go there, and it was really nice because, um, like last week, I talked about how I had trouble kind of concentrating or, you know, being productive, and so that gave me the opportunity to go there and have a defined space, you know. Um, So I've been pretty good about being disciplined while uh, working at home or from home, but it is nice to have a spot. Uh, Next, we have a few topics to cover from last week, 
And uh, first thing is we'll go through the difference between IE and EG. EG, you use that when you are talking about something specific. So you can substitute EG for, instead of saying EG, you could say, for example, you know, and there was a really good reference from the previous show. Where was it? I think it was Vinny. Yeah. Was it Vinny? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he says, I have struggled with staying properly hydrated, e.g. muscle cramp. So instead of saying e.g., you could have said, for example, because it's kind of obvious what he means. He means, you know, muscle cramps, talking about hiking and moving and stuff like that. Versus IE, which means uh, rather than, for example, it's, um, I think I just messed it up. <laughs> so uh, it's, you say EG when you know what, well, you know what you want to say. You're being vague, but really there's a, there's an obvious thing. answer. Okay. Yeah. There's a specific thing. Yeah. So, whereas you use IE, meaning that they can be any number of things. So, actually, I think I, for example, does not apply to the EG. It actually applies to IE. So, whereas, um, whereas uh, Mike I from last week, he talked about uh, omega 3s and he said, Are there any supplements that you would recommend taking? And he could say, For example, fish oil, but he said I, IE instead. So, that right there. You know, those are good, two good uses. And so, people use that wrong all the time. Yeah. Goodness. People use lots of things all the wrong. All the there's, time. there's a sign that is on a major, so Carnegie Major Road in Cleveland. And there's a car wash sign that says, we accept all major credit cards. And <laughs> major, or sorry, credit cards is in quotations and it bugs me like because there's absolutely <laughs> no reason why there are quotations around the credit cards unless they're accepting other things that are not credit cards <laughs> anyway i uh, so pet peeve of mine. that reminds me of austin powers um <laughs> where he's like laser so that's that's pretty funny um i i love our patrons to death but but I am having to do a little bit of a little bit of uh, grammar um, policing of some of these comments, so I can read the damn things whenever I. And anybody who knows me knows that if um, I am the one that is having to edit your grammar, then Godspeed. Um, that's what Grammarly so, is for. There you seriously, go. that's yeah, a plug. Right. One yeah. of my favorites. I want them as a sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's an excellent point, Lindsay. Um, what's next? Lindsay, oh, okay. Lindsay does not endorse Gatorade, but she will gladly be sponsored by Grammarly. <laughs> yeah, Grammarly. Yeah, exactly. Hashtag, that's, that's, that's... I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great. Yeah. So I, I think that that's what people like about this podcast is we've got, we go from quotations to Grammarly to beer to the pelvic floor and pooping here in a little bit. And next as a, segue next we're going to talk about tannins and steeping your team to uh, your tea too long what'd you find for us Lindsay? so all right so a couple of things with the antioxidant uh amount so there's there's different kinds of teas right there's white tea black tea green tea and then there's herbal tea which is technically you know not from tea leaves so it's categorically different than the first three but so for tea from tea leaves, a, it, it depends largely on the temperature of the water. So if you're doing like boiling water, then you want to do it for just a minute or two and then take the tea bag out. Otherwise, the antioxidant content starts to go down. But if your water isn't boiling or let's say you're making iced tea or something, you're doing it in cold water, then longer is better and it becomes higher in antioxidants. For herbal tea, you you do like most of the time for the most common herbal teas that people make, you know, you want super, you know, hot water and you actually do want it to steep for a while. So many of the packages will say like 10 minutes covered is where you get the most 
benefit, and that's antioxidants, but there's other nutrients in herbal teas too. Um, so are you guys familiar? Have you seen, um, I'm trying to think of the name. There's a couple different, uh, Ancient Nutritionals is one of them, and they make all sorts of tea. So they have one called Throat Coat that's really good. Mm. Um, that has like marshmallow root extract and slippery elm, and uh, it can be really good and soothing for your GI tract, especially your throat. But those require a longer period of time to get more of those therapeutic ingredients into the tea. While we're on this topic, th that was informative. That was excellent. <laughs> I really like that word, steeping. Steeping. Um, yeah, that's a good word. Have you heard about people adding lion's mane into their coffee or people you make like mushroom coffee? Yes. So uh, there, I mean, there's a, a lot of different, so there's a lot of different like coffee alternatives. The mushroom coffee, have you, have either of you had that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just over the weekend I did. What, which, what is your opinion? What did you think of the flavor? Well, I love my friend to death. I was visiting, <laughs> shout out my friend, Mark and Taryn. I was visiting, uh, and all he had was cold coffee, and I absolutely hate cold coffee. But I um, – so two things. One, I hate cold coffee, so I was really busy just chugging it down. Two, for the caffeine hit. And then two, uh, I have a very poor sense of smell slash taste. My opinion is I didn't like it because it was cold, and oh, I it was remember – cold? Was it – coffee mixed with mushroom or lion's mane or whatever it's it's four st sigmatic oh. that he purchased on amazon i really want to like that stuff but i just cannot i i don't like it at all i've tried it yeah. so many times we had it in our break room in my mm -hmm. clinical world because we had i mean we had all sorts of things I mean, we would make like bulletproof coffee um but i just i couldn't I couldn't do it. But some of those, um, well, a lot of those different additives for kind of the healthier coffees. One, you know, the thought is get away from regular coffee, which we definitely have to have a coffee episode because I'm very mm -hmm. opinionated on coffee. Um, but the other is that they can have these adaptogenic properties and immune boosting properties. So simulating your immune system, buffering the stress response. So they, they do have, you know, health benefits. But for me, it's like, if you really enjoy something like coffee, then just get good coffee Yeah, and enjoy. It. I mean, it's like one of those things that can be a health food on its own if you get really good coffee. So there is some evidence to that supports some of these other yeah. non bean oh, yeah. coffees. Okay, cool. Next. So here's a comment from one of our patrons, remember, if you'd like to uh, leave us comments for the show, you can sign up at advancingathletics.com forward slash subscribe. And there, we have lots of per perks to offer you, including being able to write into our show, contribute. And our first comment is from Kurt B. And he says, thanks for last week's detailed answers. I will be trying liquid IV tomorrow since I will be working outside in the muggy heat most of the day. I'm excited to see how my body holds up since I planned ahead today. Fueling and hydrating properly today for a better tomorrow. Is there any flavors you recommend over the others? So I guess the first thing is, sorry, you're not going to hear this until multiple days. <laughs> after, so, so you'll have to let us know what you end up choosing, Kurt. Uh, but secondly, uh, do you have anything to add, Lindsay? Um, so it, to my knowledge, the only flavors I've seen are lemon lime and passion fruit. And the I, I don't care for the lemon lime, but I, I like the passion fruit of the two. Mm -hmm. What okay. about you, Alex? Right, Alex? You've had it too, right? Yeah, those are the only two flavors I know of as well. I've never had the passion fruit. I've only had the lemon lime and I thought it was fine. So <laughs> I guess it just personal depends preference, on yeah. personal preference. Have you had any Dells this year, Alex, yet? No, I don't think any of the stands have been open given everything yet. Uh -oh. I know they probably have started opening, but no, not yet. Okay, so with that, that we've got most of the things covered from last week and our our 
what tertiary our that's homework. not the right word <laughs> yeah our homework as but we being did last in, week like being in for, since we've all been in in like a patient or client facing role wouldn't you say that you learn so much from people's questions because you're forced to just always be like learning yeah it almost keeps you honest it, it like makes sure that you're always absorbing more information, looking things up, trying to yeah. improve yourself to help that person in front of you and vice versa. They think of things that maybe I just would never see or something's applicable to their life and be, cause I'm not, I'm not in their shoes. I don't see, you know, some of the solutions that they see, some of the, um, their people are so creative. They come up with like these great ideas for us. Um, yeah, I learn so much from them all the time. So thank you everyone. So with that, Alex, let's talk about the core. Yeah. So this week I wrote an introductory article on the core and kind of discussing some of the myths we have about it, understanding of what it actually is. Uh, I I meant this as an intro article. So there's going to be more information kind of coming forward about actual exercises you can do and strengthening concepts and things like that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. This is just more to cover the bases because I think it, a big piece in understanding the core is first um, opening yourself to language, right, around what the core means. I think if we asked a bunch of different people on the street what what exercising the core meant, you'd get a bunch of different answers, which is fine because there pro- are loads and loads and loads of ways to do it. But I think um, recognizing what all is involved can help us enhance how we train and how we prep our bodies. I think intuitively, a lot of us peop- a lot of us know, oh, we need to have a strong core. I think that's a common um, thought process that if your core is strong, you won't get back pain or you know it's the key to running fast and all these things. But what does that actually mean? So when we talk about the core, we're kind of thinking, I want you to think it's this dynamic canister. So it's not just a canister. And I want to make that um, stress that point because it is this it is this concept that it is can move in multiple directions and we can't put stops in any direction. All right. So you've got a top of the canister, which is the diaphragm. You have the bottom, which is our pelvic floor muscles. We've got our abdominals in front, and then we have our back muscles, and like our back extensors in back. And so together, they all create this amazing movement construct that I think a lot of us refer to as the core. So in working our way through it, we've got the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is this really amazing muscle that sits right at the top of, of the quote-unquote core. It's right where our sternum ends and it sits in our rib cage there. And so it's that separation between our lungs and then what lies below. And it is an incredible muscle. So when we breathe in, what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to contract and flatten out. And then when we exhale, it rises back up. And so by flattening out, what it does is it lets our oxygen fill our lungs so we can expand. And when we do that, ideally, what we should see is expansion of the ribs as well. So it's this lowering of the diaphragm to open up the lungs to fill with air. When that diaphragm lowers, what it does is it creates pressure beneath it. And that's where the rest of the core is going to get involved when we talk about managing our pressure and our intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, So by depending what the excursion is, it's going to affect how much pressure we create beneath it. We also have heard probably multiple times, you know, take a deep breath that helps relax you. I think people are familiar with diaphragmatic breathing. I think maybe we'll, we'll definitely talk about, you know, the ins and outs of how to do it to make sure you're optimizing your diaphragmatic breath. But when that happens, the reason it gives us relaxation Uh, sensation and change is because when the diaphragm starts to lower, it stimulates our vagus nerve, which prompts like our relaxation system. And so what that can do in, in triggering the vagus nerve is then it can change the stress hormones we're releasing. And it can just have this, uh, effect that then just brings us down to a more calm state. 
in that, we start to lower our heart rate because, again, we're filling with more air in our lungs. We're, we're taking a deeper, slower breath. So it's the heart doesn't have to pump as quickly. And so our heart rate can lower. And so to give you an idea of a diaphragmatic breath here, what I want you to think is you're going to breathe through your nose. And as you breathe through your nose, I want you to put your hand on like your chest and your stomach and just take a normal breath breath through your nose here. And I want you to just note what you feel moving. Some people, they might feel their chest rise and fall. Other people might feel their belly come in and out. Other people might feel like the walls of their ribs go sideways. And just kind of know what you feel moving and where it's moving. And then what I want you to visualize with the, this next breath is I want you to think that the breath in is kind of like you are an umbrella. And so you are opening up in all directions. A true diaphragmatic breath isn't just a belly breath where you're breathing forward into your hands. You want to have excursion in all directions. And so sometimes people like doing this breath as this exploratory breath as they're figuring it out. Sometimes they like it on the floor because they can feel themselves breathe into the wall or they'll sit and have something on their in their back so they can feel if they're putting pressure into the backside of their ribs as they're getting that breath in. Um, But you're going to breathe through your nose and I want you to visualize it's that breath that's expanding forward, backwards, side to side. And sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes people might know one side expands more than the other. Um, They might feel movement in one direction more than the other, or they just feel they can't get it out of their chest. But all of that information is really helpful because it tells us about how you move and maybe where you're more stiff in one area and can move more easily in another. And so with that, once you've kind of taken in that umbrella breath, you then will exhale. And as you exhale, I want you to think, just let yourself naturally recoil. I don't want you to force this exhale, but let let yourself breathe out through your lips um, like you're blowing out candles. Okay. Not a forced one. It's just like a casual um, blow up there. Um, And that's kind of where you can get started. Now, one thing I will say is posture is really important uh, when you're considering your breath, because if I'm someone who stands really tall with my chest forward, like I think definitely when we worked with the um, Massachusetts National Guard members, a lot of them stood very erect. And when that happens, your rib cage gets flaunted forward a little bit. And so that's going to change if we think if if there's this attachment where the um, diaphragm's resting inside the ribs, if I move those ribs forward, where the diaphragm then moves through is going to change. And so I think it's important to recognize that depending where your rib position is, it's going to affect the breath and where it goes. Same thing with down below, depending where your pelvis is, it can change the direction of the pressure that you feel through that breath. And so If you're someone who is very erect, see if getting like your ribs stacked over your hips is possible. And this is a future article I'm going to write. So we're going to talk about this. So stay tuned for that. Um, But that might be one correction you may need. Or if you're someone who's very hunched forward and you tend to kind of slouch, again, now you're starting from a curled position. So the excursion of the diaphragm down when you breathe in might be affected. So we might have to lift you up a little bit. And so playing around with that, playing around with your posture, some people need pillows initially to kind of align themselves and either put them under their shoulders so they aren't so erect um, or put something underneath so they kind of come out of that a little bit. Uh, So it's, it's a fun kind of experiment that you can kind of start to work on and get familiar with um, and, and make it relaxing. You know, don't be stressed if you're only breathing in one way area or not. Um, this is one thing we'll talk about with training is training your breath it does take a little bit of time just because it's not something so many of us really think about initially. And so it's like any other exercise. The more you do it, the more familiar you get with it, um, the easier it becomes. And then you can start doing different things with it as well. And so that brings us to our first comment from Jean G, who post, posted on our forum, and she says, Thanks, Alex, for that thorough explanation of core and all that it's involved in. Sorry, folks. I just, I kind of have a hard time reading things aloud sometimes, so um, I appreciate your patience. So, Jean goes on to say, I have a few questions that relate to the core. Her, She first says, what can someone do to prevent and manage if they get side stitches while running? 
That's a great question, Jean. And I think it's my very similar answer to how Lindsay approached it last week, where there's stuff that we can do preemptively beforehand that will prepare us for later on, but then things that we can do in the moment when like that side stitch comes on. So there's a few things I want to, would consider, you know, does, do side stitches come on frequently? Is it early in the run? Is it at a certain speed? Is it, if you're gaining elevation, going down, is it at a certain distance? So all of those things about when they come on might give us some answers. Um, but first sit, talking about what we can do proactively, I think a big piece is going to be learning to breathe and use your diaphragm and getting used to excursion. There's a lot of muscles that attach to our chest, which then is going to impact how we breathe. So um, our pec muscles wrap around the front of our ribs. So if those are not moving well, or let's say I'm getting hunched over while I run and I'm really kind of just curled over fighting through my arms are kind of curled and my shoulders are curled in, it puts those pecs in a more shortened position. And so when those are kind of hugging the chest and pushing down on the chest, you can imagine then you're not at the, your breath in has to fight against that and has to, for the lungs to expand, has to push against that stiffness. And if, if your breathing muscles aren't strong, but you're really good at using your pec muscles or your pec muscles are in such a short position that it's hard to lengthen them, you can imagine that that can make breathing a little bit more difficult. So I think um, one thing on the proactive side is we want to make sure that you've got good thoracic mobility. So that's your upper back. Its job is to rotate. And so we want to make sure that, especially with runners, that you're getting that natural rotation. Every time my arm goes back, that's going to help me draw some tension through my from my arm to my hip, and it's going to help me create that counter rotation into my next step. So if I'm not getting that natural kind of rotation and I'm just slumped forward, I'm losing some efficiency, which then means I have to work a little bit harder. I'm not, um, my legs maybe have to start doing more work. My trunk maybe has to start doing more work, and we look for compensations that way. So this this is going to be, my first answer is going to be strengthen your core. <laughs> like let's let's see why breathing might become difficult. Let's make sure that we're training your diaphragm, that we're training your abdominals, your back extensors, your pelvic floor, that we're, you're learning how to use that system and to use that system dynamically in your training, that we are making sure that you can rotate through your upper trunk, that you can use your hips efficiently. And they're not the thing that's giving you stability because your core is not doing it for you. So I think training appropriately becomes important. Lindsay's Lindsay's all about this next one is going to be fuel, fueling, hydration, good nutrition. Um, you want to make sure that you are it that you are not getting the side stitch because you're not fueling property properly. Sorry, I think warm up becomes important. So making sure you know for so many people that beginning part of the run is the hardest part of the run because your cardiovascular system has to catch up to to that enormous act that you are doing, that if you don't warm up appropriately, you don't get your heart rate up and you don't prepare yourself for the task, your body's playing catch up. And I think sometimes if people are getting a big burst of speed or they're diving right in, sometimes it can be not too long after that, that they start to feel that side stitch. Um, so just making sure you've got a good warm up, and then that you're focusing on breath work as you go. If you're in the moment and, and the side stitch comes on, I think, I think there's probably for me like two big go twos. Pay attention to your breath, a change like your speed. So, um, and again, we've talked about this before is create variability in the system. Sometimes if we start moving too much the same way, the body starts to either get used to that position or again, if we're not expanding our ribs because we're kind of hunched over, we're too tall and we're not getting, getting good breaths in, our body might, or the, the rib muscles might be grabbing, giving you that side stitch. Your abdominals might be giving you that side stitch because they're not getting the movement and the excursion that they need. And so if you think about maybe change your cadence up a little bit, cadence is how fast you're stepping. Um, and so maybe... Playing with that will change your mechanics above and below. Sometimes then assessing your breath. If you're taking two breaths, if, if it's two strides to breathe in and two strides to breathe out, play with it. 
do two two breaths in and then maybe make three like a three second exhale on that stride out if you manipulate your breath work while you're doing that that's going to change your excursion uh, of the ribs so it's going to again provide a different input force the muscles and the abs and the ribs to change position a little bit and then assess yourself are you getting really tall are you getting hunched over have you started kind of always just dropping to one side you know um are you looking at someone and it's because you're looking at them and you've been turned and you're talking to them the whole time that those muscles have shortened up on the one side opposite of where you're turned to that they just need to get some love and lengthen out again. And so you kind of change that. Are you going around the same direction in a track and can you reverse it? I think there's so many things that can play a role. And so it's that self-awareness of this is what I'm feeling. What are a few things I can do to manipulate myself out of it? And I think the biggest ones are self-awareness to the position you've fallen in. Can you change it by either slowing down, changing your cadence, um, or adjusting your breathing? Yeah, I think along that line that, you know, not only maybe do you always, so like when I run with my friend Abby, I'm always on the left and she's always on the right. That's a part of it. I also think that... If you sit the same way at work all the time and then you go out for a run, then you're going to have those differences between the two sides that will show up when you're running. Because kind of like the prevention thing Alex talked about at the beginning about how much expansion expansion has to occur with the diaphragm and your rib cage. And if the only if the only time that you ever get that expansion is when you're running, then those muscles don't get, aren't prepared for that activity. So they're going to, the work was really going to get ratcheted up. And then along with that too, I think, I, uh, I think another issue might be from a lot of people that Alex is going to talk about this a little bit later, uh, in her article, but a lot of people struggle with holding their breath and, we know that isometric exercises are pretty challenging, meaning that's like when you hold stuff, you know? And so if you're holding your breath as you're running, those muscles are having to keep your lungs expanded and they're having to hold those contractions. And then I wonder if some of that contributes to it as well. I think for sure. And to add to your point, I think that was really good tying in. What do you do during the rest of your day? What are the positions that you lie in? Um, or sit in or work in and how might that contribute and so I think for people who maybe are driving a lot or doing desk work you know there could potentially be that um, curled forward posture or their arms are down at their sides and when they're heavy like just arms are long and heavy and they pull on our ribs and they pull on our trunk and so if they stay down at our sides all day long you can imagine then when they're swinging and you're trying to move, there might potentially be some stiffness that's built up throughout the day uh, in those muscle groups. And so shoulder blade pinches throughout the day, reaching up above your head, doing some wall slides throughout your day on your desk or on, on a wall could help just reverse some of the positions that you tend to fall in throughout your day. And it could just be, you know, 10 shoulder blade pinches every hour on the hour is a great way just to reverse things. And I think just incorporating those and being mindful of those can help uh, balance us out a little bit better. Okay. So with that being said, uh, we will continue. The next part is the pelvic floor. All right. So we've got the diaphragm up top and then we have the pelvic floor at the bottom. And I think this is a muscle group that's definitely gaining some steam. I think people are hearing about it more. We're definitely starting to understand it more. Get it. Gaining some steam. Oh, stop. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, continue. And so it, it's this very important muscle group. And I think it's really, really important for me to emphasize males and females both have pelvic floors. All right. Pelvic floor issues are not only for people who've had babies. And they're not only for old people who might have some incontinence issues, okay? It is a muscle group like any other muscle group in our body. And so it's really important that we treat it as such and give it the respect as such. 
um, because there's a lot we can do to train. And it's an amazing, amazing muscle group that just once you figure out how to incorporate it in your training, it frees up your hips to be more efficiently. You know, a lot of times people who come in with back pain or hip issues and, you know, they feel that they've tried everything. Sometimes linking in the pelvic floor is the missing is the missing piece to it. And because so many people don't look at that component that it can be missed out. And so if people have hip issues, if people have back issues, I really strongly emphasize bringing it up. If you are seeking care, like I, I'm just curious if the pelvic floor might be involved. And I think that we'll get a lot of practitioners thinking and again, recognizing that it, it can play such an important role. So the pelvic floor muscles are layered. They're in the bowl of our pelvis. And so they, just like the diaphragm, can lengthen and shorten. And I think intuitively, we, we, we kind of know, oh, that's how we stop the flow of urine or that's how we allow the flow of urine. Where exactly are they located, Alex, for people who don't know? So they're located on the inside. So this, I think that's where sometimes this is a muscle group we can't see without going in. So if you've gotten a rectal exam, when you when it a finger's inserted, um, what they're palpating for is different stuff in there. But initially, as you go through that, you are entering into the, the muscle group that's there and then vice versa on the front side. Uh, we've got the muscles. So um, again, they're layered down in the pelvis um, in a bowl. And I can definitely, um, the next article that I bring up and just start discussing the pelvic floor, I'll have some pictures so you can kind of see what that looks like. Cause I think audio, audio, like being able to hear it from the audio perspective might be challenging. And so just think for listeners, think about the, the diamond, so to speak, that goes from the inside. So, um, so think about sitting on a diamond. So the one point is by your anus. The, 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 that's the back point. The front point goes to whatever uh, external organ that you have, and male or female that is. And then there's those two sit bones that you are supposed to sit on when you sit properly and you sit up tall. Those are the two sides of the diamonds. Yeah. So just some orientation. Yeah, and then the area between, if you've ever heard of the perineum, it's the area between the two holes. Um, And so again, it can shorten and it can lengthen and we want to make sure it can do both. And so I think sometimes people think, oh, if I've had a baby, the pelvic floor lengthens, it stretches out so the kid could come out. But uh, also we can leak and have issues when it doesn't lengthen and it's caught in a shorter position. So just remember, we want that excursion. And with it, you know, the pelvic floor is there to help keep organs on the inside because we don't want anything falling out. Uh, It helps to manage our pressure again. So if I've got that breath in and suddenly my diaphragm has lowered and as the diaphragm lowers, you know, there's pressure that's being created because that space that once when our diaphragm was high up in our ribs, it has now pushed down. And when it pushes down, you know, pressure is created. And I think anyone who's familiar with lifting, you know, if you've heard of the Valsalva maneuver where you hold your breath and go, um, that's created by this pressure. And so as the pressure goes down in the diaphragm, we want to make sure that there isn't too much pressure that's existing inside the trunk area itself. So the pelvic floor has this amazing job that as the diaphragm lowers and the breath goes in, it also lowers to help give a little more room for that pressure to be created. And then as we exhale um, and the diaphragm rises, um, the pelvic floor then also returns to its um, shorter state. Okay. So a lot of times when people are learning to connect with their pelvic floor, we'll do it with diaphragmatic breathing and teach that excursion process of um, when the breath comes in, the pelvic floor should lengthen and lower. And then when you exhale, the pelvic floor should rise. And I think if you're experimenting this at home, one thing I really want to stress is when the pelvic floor lowers, it is not a bearing down. So you are not trying to push the pelvic floor. It should happen more naturally. Um, then it, the pelvic floor is also there for stability. Okay. So what's really cool is it's one of our stabilizers that turns on before we act. And so this is 
we we need this. Think about any time we run, you know, we want to make sure that we're stabilizing before our foot hits the ground and not after the fact, right? Because then we lose some efficiency in the system. And so it's it has this amazing ability to again provide stability because again it stops the air from completely leaving us once our once that we've created some pressure we don't want to have no pelvic floor tension because then that's potentially when someone may be leaking again there can be different reasons for it um we want to hold some of that pressure in us because that pressure is helping us that pressure is helping our abdominals it's helping us control our trunks our hips can move uh, more efficiently so our shoulders can move more efficiently and so in being able to act proactively for us and get ready for us before we um, complete a movement, we become much more stable. And then it helps with our, um, you know, voiding, urination, passing of gas, sexual activity. It acts as a um, sub pub for us. So our lymphatic system for swelling um, and getting fluid, like sometimes we can get congestion in the pelvis. And so it's one of our drainage areas. And so making sure again, that the pelvic floor is working well, um, will allow, you know, potentially, you know, your lymph if your lymphatics are working better, you don't, you're not having as much swelling, you know, after heavy activity, that's a great thing. It means you're getting rid of the toxins that you've created from your hard workout. We need that system to help empty it. And so the pelvic floor helps with that as well. So is it both involuntary and voluntary muscle? Yes. Yeah. Um, And I think that's one of the amazing things about it. And I think that's where sometimes we accept that oh, I leak, it's just part of getting older, oh, I just sneezed and it happens every time because we don't realize there's this voluntary component to it. I think sometimes we just expect it to turn on and turn off and do what it's supposed to do. And most of the time, that is how the system was created to be. However, we, in our daily activities and how we live our life, we develop these movement patterns and maybe tendencies and habits that maybe throw the system off. Even just an experience of pain throws off our ability to connect with that system. Like there's research kind of showing that. So it's like, um, sometimes we have to have a reason to talk to it again and get it doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, And that takes voluntary control. And then eventually, I if I've done my job and the person that we are working with has done their job and they've learned to connect with that system and use that system and it's become efficient for them, they won't have to think about it. You know, they won't have to actively think, okay, I, I need to relax my muscles there or I need to contract my muscles there. They're just going to start to learn how to incorporate it and it's going to become a system to them um, that's integrated and just part of how they move. But we need that intention sometimes to like recalibrate it and use it again. And I want you to think like, because of where it's located, think about again, you don't have to have a baby for it to get disrupted. Think about a fall. If you were running and you like hit your foot on a rock and you stumbled and there was a jolt, if your pelvis shifted or if you moved in some sort of way that kind of jarred you and caused you to like tighten up in some places, think of how that could affect that area of the body. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be a significant trauma or childbirth. There's a lot in between that can impact it. And again, it, it's so good, I think, at covering up for other muscle groups that sometimes because of that, we learn to like rely on just like this contraction of it um, to stabilize us and we don't give it a chance to relax. And so that's where that person who's like, oh, I've, if I leak and I do a bunch of kegels and it's not working, maybe you're not the person that is relaxing. Maybe it's on too much and we need to get it to shut off a little bit. So there's a lot that can kind of go in with that. But to answer your question originally, yes, we do have control. So another point with that, Alex, I think just um, another example to help with that, talking about uh, Lindsay's question about voluntary versus involuntary, it's not exactly the same because you have some reflexive bits down there that you really don't have control over. Yeah. But um, so it's more, it's more textbook in the definition of involuntary, but think of how you like, you don't have to wake up in the morning and actively tell your neck to hold your head up. Right. So all of us are just, our heads are automatically held up. So those muscles just work. They just organically work. 
So, or automatically work, I guess. So apply that same concept to your pelvic floor and then dysfunction can occur similarly, the same way that we have to address somebody's neck sometimes. So it's the same way that sometimes we have to help with your pelvic floor. We're not at like, this is probably on, this is a little bit taboo still, or a lot taboo maybe. Um, so some of you might feel uncomfortable with it. So, you know, you can start to learn a little bit more about this part of your body and, you know, and to be honest, one thing I've had some people do that I've worked with is that one thing that you can do that I've heard of is that you can take like a tennis ball and roll it around all the muscles. So you can sit on a tennis ball and just start to become a little bit more aware of some of those muscles. Now, remember, you're not playing pool, so it doesn't go in the holes. So you just want to move around the muscle parts and just start to get to know some of those muscles again that that you just weren't that aware of the same way that you would use a foam roller. With that being said, we have another question from Jean G and she says, now again, inside baseball folks, listeners jump on the train now, because right now we have enough room for you to ask multiple parts of, of, or multiple questions, multiple things in one question. So, um, Jean has the luxury of getting multiple questions answered now. So that won't last for long as numbers keep our and memberships keep going up. So just keep that in mind. But what she asks is what stretches or exercises can somebody do if they occasionally have urine leakage while running? Alex. Um, I think this is a very big question because again, there's never like this one reason anything occurs. Every person is unique into themselves and they have their own movement history, their own movement expression. And so the way they move is unique to them. And so why someone might be leaking uh, may be different why another person might be. Um, I think the the things that I would certainly consider, and it's going to be very similar to like when do side stitches occur, is like, is leaking occurring at the same time? You know, is it uh, at a certain speed? Are you gaining elevation? Not all those things are going to play a role. I think um, how fatigued you are and what muscle groups you feel working might play a role. And again, now that we are aware of the canister, think of if you're too tall or too short. And if you're creating a lot of pressure going down and you don't have, and your pelvic floor is not working appropriately to help manage that pressure, potentially that could be why we're linking. So again, is it because your ribs are in a position that maybe isn't allowing the rest, allowing proper excursion of the diaphragm that maybe your abdominals aren't expanding? or opening up as they should, or you're not rotating as you should, any of these reasons can cause pressure down. And if we're not managing that pressure down, or we're not turning on certain muscles when we should be turning on certain muscles, like it, um, if the, like I said, how the pelvic floor should be contracting before impact, um, if that's not occurring, any of those reasons could be why someone might leak. And so I think another one too is stride length. If someone's stride is getting very long and the legs are kind of opened in that position and we're not managing, again, how we're moving the pressure in our system, potentially maybe that could be why. It, again, there's so many different reasons. And is the pelvic floor working really hard to help stabilize you when you and you don't have the trunk control, the hip control, and using those where they need to be used when you're running? And so the pelvic floor is just getting fatigued out. And that's why it might be leaking. So that's a very kind of person dependent answer. And I'm definitely happy to talk further uh, if if she wants to. Yes, you can email me directly at move at advancingathletics.com. So just like Alex men just mentioned, the pelvic floor is involved with that, you know, controlling of, you know, voiding, peeing or pooping. So... Um, not only is it important to have understand what your body or what you're doing when you're sitting on the toilet or you're at the urinal, but also some of the foods uh, that can also aid in that. So, Lindsay, can you just give us a brief beginner's guide to like digestive regularity to help with that? Yeah. So, a couple of things, but probably the most important if we think about pressure. Um, you know, in and around 
the canister, well, I guess in the canister, right, um, is that you you want to be going to the bathroom at least once a day, if not twice a day, because if you're not going enough and you have waste products sitting in your digestive tract, it's going to be fermenting, creating gas and more pressure. And it's so, pooping, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So, um, so you want to be having, you know, two like I said, one to two bowel movements every single day. And that will help in terms of the amount of uh, pressure gas production. Um, so the basics of that really are staying hydrated, making sure that you get enough fiber in your diet, mostly from fruits, vegetables, grains. Those are going to be you know, and beans, probably the best sources for regularity. Um, and then Activity and gravity play a role as well. So, you know, if you're sitting, you're not going to be stimulating your digestive tract a whole lot. So if you're up, moving around, you sort of have gravity on your side and um, you'll be more likely to be regular. There are a lot of different factors here that's definitely like short and sweet version. But if, you know, if you want to get down the foundational things, fluid, fiber, activity, um, and then last, I would say stress. So when you're stressed, your digestive system basically stops because your body thinks it's not important. Um, so, you know, that's why people will take a book into the bathroom or something relaxing because literally you're turning on that uh, part of your nervous system that's calming and your body says, oh, like we're not being chased by a bear so we can digest our food. And that can take on a lot of different things. Like you don't necessarily have to read in the bathroom, but if you can take some time maybe do some diaphragmatic breathing or something else that puts you, you know, in a relaxed state that can certainly aid in regularity. And it's so great just to tie everything together is that what also gets tense whenever you're all stressed out muscles. So what it, you're, it, it feeds into itself having an even harder time going to the bathroom, whether you like it or not, it's kind of like, it's all connected, you know, and not just like in a touchy feely way in like a legit way. I'll save the rest of my poop tricks for the poop show, and I can oh, yeah. talk all about going too much, not enough. We can well, whip out the crystal scale. Well, do you remember the – the? and then when you mentioned activity, gravity and activity, remember the pickle incident of 2020 when I had too many pickles, and then we went on – I went on my Tuesday run. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so it's hard for me to forget, so – you guys might have, but you but, won't do it again, right? But I won't do it again. And I love pickles. Holy shit. I just got to eat them on Wednesday, not Monday. So next is, um, let's move forward and talk about the abdominals and back muscles. All right. And so this is now looking at the front and the back side of the core. And so we've got deep layers and then we have more superficial layers and they do act a little bit differently. Uh, so we've got a uh, muscle that runs really deep. It's called the transverse abdominis. I think people have really run with this one. I think, you know, there's been this, I think, shift in, we used to like grip it and pull it in. Like if you've ever heard draw in your belly button and, you know, try to push your back into the floor. A lot of times the idea was to target this muscle um, because we are aware it's this deep stabilizer that we have in us. Um, but in doing that, I think we've started moving in extremes and we maybe aren't also paying attention to how we activate this muscle. And so gripping and turning on, are we using breath holding techniques to do that? How are we actually achieving what we perceive as a contraction of this muscle? And this is going to be something I talk about later on. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but just know that we have this deep flat muscle um, that um, should flatten and also have an excursion and it's a big stabilizer for us. Then we've got our muscles running diagonally. So we have external and internal obliques. And then we've got our six pack muscles, which I think people are very familiar with in the front there They're called our rectus abdominis. And then we've got our back muscles. And so we've got ones on the sides called our quadratus lumborum. We've got our spinal rectors. And then we have deep ones called multifidi. And so, you know, 
now I think you can kind of visualize that whole completion of the canister. And the amazing thing with these muscles is what I want you to think about is they're very multi-directional in how they run and what they attach to. And so we have muscles that go straight up and down. We have muscles that kind of flatten and wrap. We have ones that are diagonal in nature. And this is what helps give us our mobility. This is what lets us bend forward, extend backwards, turn to the side, turn to the other side. So these muscles are what help make us move. And so again, going back to pressure, um, think of if I am gripping my stomach muscles because I think that I should have them turned on all the time or I'm trying to look a certain way. So I'm just pulling and pulling in. What I want you to think is that is like taking a corset to that canister. And suddenly when your diaphragm is trying to lower, um, you are creating a block for it. Okay, so if your diaphragm can't move down and the pressure is just running into the wall of your abdominals, then potentially, okay, your pelvic floor might suddenly lose that connection point with the diaphragm. And this is where movement falls start to occur. It's something we keep bringing up. So, yes, this is we want a strong core. And I think don't think the more you turn on, the stronger you're going to be. It's learning how to apply it. And so we are not meant to be stomach grippers. Okay, we are. Our abdominals are endurance muscles because we are upright creatures, so they have to last us moving a long period of time. And gripping is this strong kind of force, like Michaela said, like isometric contraction, which are very difficult to do. And so they are, that is asking your abdominal muscles to function in a way that maybe they weren't meant to function in walking around and sitting and things like that. Um, the other thing with where they become important is when we are strong through our entire core, through this entire canister and our abdominal muscles, our back muscles, our diaphragm, our pelvic floor are all working together. We're super stable in our trunk, right? Because now if you can visualize, we've covered from our ribs all the way down to our pelvis, front and back side. So that is going to free up our arms to move, our legs and our hips to move. And so sometimes when we're less efficient through there and we have leaks in the system through our trunk and we're getting extra extra movement there, we're not stabilizing in certain ways or stabilizing at the right time. Suddenly, maybe our hips have to compensate a little bit more. And so they're starting to pull in to help keep us stable. Or, um, you know, I have to kind of pull my arm down at my side to gain some stability through my trunk. And then I can't reach quite as far or get uh, my arm up to do, you know, a clean or do an actual task at work because suddenly you're not as strong through your trunks. You're trying to gain stability other places. So you're starting to bring in your extremities to do so when really if we're optimally working our trunk and our core system, then hopefully that frees up our extremities to do the amazing tasks that they're supposed to. I think one of the things that that people get frustrated with, and I'm totally in this boat, is if you're used to like hardcore exercise, lifting, hit, running long distances, or you're super active at your job, when you get into these like more mental, like slow, methodical, like connecting with your body, it's annoying for people who are like, go, go, go. And it's like, wait, I want to be doing something more intense than this, but you really have to do that mental work of like connecting with that muscle and make sh- making sure like you know what's happening because it, it's ignored like most of the day. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things. I think that I totally agree. Like, unless we feel it, are we really using it? Like, I think there's this mindset that we have to feel something intensely. Um, but again, this muscle group tends to be a endurance muscle group. And so you will feel it, do it long enough or challenged enough in the right way. You will feel it. But I think, again, we have to connect with it to be able to identify how it's being used. And so it's, it's, I, you can challenge your core and feel it very easily in multiple positions, doing different things, like amazing exercises, but we first just have to learn how to connect with the little things and build yourself up. And as soon as you do, like you can be so, so athletic with um, how we challenge the core. And so I think, like you said, it can be frustrating in learning how to turn stuff on. But I think if you, if you, 
I think sometimes what people get surprised about with isolate, more quote unquote isolated, nothing's totally isolated, but more targeted exercises where we're specifically working on a muscle group, people would be shocked how little or how not fancy the exercise can be in order to feel it, that you can really humble a person showing them how to do something properly. And we take out their compensatory patterns and their strategies that they use to cheat, not always by choice, but because they're good at moving a different way, they don't do the way that we're targeting per se. And so you can shock someone by saying, okay, well, now you're not allowed to do this, or we change the position of a leg, takes away their compensatory strategy, and suddenly it's very difficult. And so I think in slowing it down and changing things up, um, recognize that it can still be hard and just take that time in the beginning, build it up, integrate it. We're not going to take someone's exercise routine away from them, especially if you are not in pain. Like, yes, this is going to be a component. I want you to learn to connect with these body parts, but I still need you to work out and feel strong and build yourself and train yourself for what you need to do throughout your day. And hopefully if we do it intentionally and pick our exercises appropriately, the one will build into the other very nicely, but we're never going to take some someone's workout away from them either. It's just, again, this is what warmups are for. This is where intentional exercise choice comes in, where we make sure we put it in, but you still feel challenged in other ways as well. So you don't lose that uh, oh so good feeling from a workout. And it's like the principle of the, of the matter. So you should be able to turn on these muscles. Like a good analogy, I think, is like eating carrots and peanut butter. So if you think about like your body sensation and your understanding of body awareness as the carrot, and you think of hard exercise as the peanut butter, you eat that peanut butter on your carrot, and then somebody asks you, what's that carrot taste like? And it's like, I know what carrot tastes like. Of course, I know what carrots taste like. But can has that is that person well acquainted with what a carrot tastes like or have they eaten carrots with peanut butter for so long that they actually only taste the peanut butter or the nuances of the peanut butter especially because it's such a such a potent flavor such a powerful taste so uh instead think about think about you don't have to eat all your carrots without peanut butter but you should eat at least some of your carrots without peanut butter yeah, no, I, I think it's I think it's a really good point. Like, uh, if we are training ourselves appropriately, we are challenging ourselves in different ways. And so we can't always do the same things over and over again, um, the same way and just add weight, like you're going to plateau at some point, your, your gains are gonna be different at some point. And so the more ways we can challenge something, and our body gets surprised and have to adapt, the stronger it's going to be. And that's the coolest part about all this is there is no one size. So we're going to find the one that fits for you where you still feel like you're getting the best of both worlds. And hopefully you become aware of how your body is changing. As soon as you're connecting with these other muscle groups and suddenly doing tasks that were challenging before, aren't as challenging. You're not le- like how motivating is it to not get from out of your squad car and start walking and not leap like that. If, if you can do that, suddenly that's life changing, right? Or suddenly you are maxing out on your squat because you're using your entire core system to help stabilize you, to free up your legs, to sit into your hips, to get in and out of that position and move some really good weight. Like suddenly when you start achieving, I think your goals too, and you see how the little pieces do matter, um, that's motivation in and of itself. So we have another question from Vinny A., And he says, would you be able to elaborate more on what you mean by pressure management as it relates to a well-functioning, quote, core, unquote? Thanks. Now, I think we have elaborated the shit out of pressure management by now. (laughs) So, Vinny, if you didn't get it yet, you already know Alex's email and you know how to get a hold of us on social media. So, hit us up and we're more than happy to help you. But I, I, the only thing I will and- add is that I didn't mention before is sometimes when people are learning to manage their pressure system, learning when to exhale and inhale during exercise to make it a little easier um, can be helpful for people. So um, it's usually exhale on the exertion and you inhale through the movement. So imagine the squat, you inhale on the way down and then you exhale on the way out or some of my inhale 
go into the squat and then exhale on the way out. And that can be an easy way to start integrating it. But certainly I do not want someone to have to rely on the perfect breath in to be able to control their trunk. Because when you're chasing someone or you are climbing a ladder, you are not thinking about that. So we do just start to dissociate the breath in in connecting. But from a starting point, see just the next time you're at the gym, um, challenge yourself to see if exhaling on the way out and feeling, you know, your pelvic floor floor rise um, and that you feel kind of everything coming to your center. And just, just that visual should feel, make you feel strong, right? Where you are pushing that heavy weight, you are down in the squat, you're pushing that heavy weight, you're coming back to a standing position. And when you exhale, you know, your diaphragm's going up. Where do you want to go in your squat? You want to go up, you know, your pelvic floor is going up. You're getting everything moving in the direction that you want to move in. And so sometimes that just visualizing that can help. And even to further that point, Al, do you remember, I don't remember who it was, I'm pretty sure that you and I heard it together, where somebody said rec- or recommended, like, just try to talk as you walk upstairs, as you literally, like, ascend stairs. And you'll notice how you learn how to hold your pressure while you're while you're moving. Yeah, that so, comes and that's some- from Susan Clinton, who's a rock star, yeah. so if you guys ever yeah, that's right. want to yeah. learn more about pressure, Jeff, definitely look her up. But yeah, look her yeah, up. In, yeah. It, it does. It tells us where our head is. It tells us how we're breathing in. It tells us how we're holding our pressure. And if you notice your voice, like, like the octave changes or it becomes harder, um, slower, things like that, it gives us an idea of how you're distributing your pressure. So give it a try. So with that being said, um, just maybe highlight, Al, a few, because we're starting to run a little bit long. So why don't you highlight of just a few parts of a well-functioning core? next. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because it's all repeating. Like if everything does what it's supposed to, your organs are going to be protected. You're going to be able to manage the pressure inside of you. You're going to be stable and you're going to be free to move in other places. Well, then let's bring in a question from one of our patrons who might give you uh, another or give our listeners another perspective. So Anthony P asks, what other exercises can you do to strengthen not only your core muscles, but also your hip flexors and the other areas affected by the core? I think that's a great question. I think um, it's expanding our box. Like we think of sit-ups, we think of planks, we think of certain exercises uh, when we think of, I think, challenging our abdominals, let's say. Um, I think I would put, you know, a glute bridge or a hip thrust in the core category um, because you are learning to extend your hips while keeping your trunk controlled. So I think that's a great one. I mean, there's a lot. And again, I'm going to go into different things. Carries for me are an amazing exercise. Um, It forces you to walk while you're holding weight in a certain position. So sometimes a farmer's carry will be weights at your sides. Um, waiter carry, you're at a 90 degree angle holding a weight. You can have an overhead carry. You can have anything in between. You can be mismatched in weights at, um, on sides. There's so many awesome, awesome ways to do carries. What about carrying a two-year-old? Does that count? Absolutely counts. I think I think that is the hardest carry to do because you've got this dynamic thing that you have to control as well, which is why. Yeah, it's amazing. Climb up you like your uh, Empire State Building. Yeah. And he's... But I think carries are a great way to learn how we posture ourselves and where where is your where are your ribs over your hips, where are your legs, where what is your rotation and your trunk control like? Um, and then how are you breathing when you do it? Are you gripping your abs? Are you tucking your butt underneath you? How are you carrying that out? Um, because we want it to be athletic, but we want you to be stable as well during it. And I think it's the perfect way to see your arms and your legs should feel like they're free to move in a carry. You should not feel super, super rigid through them because the whole point of the carry is to be stable through your trunk. And so when people can do that and feel that they can move quick, which is why in the new um, combat fitness test for the Army, potentially it's a really great exercise for everyone to have to be challenged to do because you are carrying heavy weight and you have to do it quickly. And again, if you're utilizing the whole idea of incorporating that in is 
letting them see that you are using your quote unquote core appropriately and moving fast because an efficient system will allow you to do so. And so I think it's making sure that we don't just do abdominal exercises where we stay still in one position. I think staying still in one position like a plank is very beneficial. We can build our endurance. Uh, It can be helpful in connecting with certain body parts, but you have to learn to become dynamic as well because life is dynamic. And so it's learning how and when to turn on the abdominals. So you can, to me, the answer is any leg exercise, any arm exercise, any trunk exercise is a core exercise. So, and also to make the point is that your hip flexors. Oh yeah, I didn't cover those, sorry. It's it's okay. Although some people include it in your core, they're not actually in your core. And so, I think that's where people compensate. When, they're, when their core is not doing their job, it's like, I need to find another thing to help me out. And so the hip flexors are really amazing because they move in, but like when they shorten, they're going to go and you're bringing your hip up like you're marching. They're shortening and turning on. And then when we extend our hip, they lengthen and so, some muscles let us rotate, some pull our legs in. We, the, the different muscles that can flex our hip um, can compensate for trunk control, pelvic control. And so I think when you are able to control your trunk and perform hip flexor based exercise like a march, like a step up, like a band resisted uh, step, um, and do that well and not have a lot of wiggle or wobble at your pelvis and stuff, you are doing a very good job controlling your trunk and your hip muscles are doing their job. If it's clean to strengthen the hip flexor, strengthen the hip extensors. So that brings us to another running related question. This one comes from Mike I and he asks, does running help your core? If so, anything specific? What exercises are most concentrated on your core? So we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, and then and then Mike says, should you use weights when involving core or simply body weight exercises? I think this is a good question. Probably stuff we've talked about a little, like hopefully you're kind of seeing the build up here. Um, any exercise is a core exercise. I'm just going to keep saying that again. Like any movement that you do um, – your trunk is going to be the basis of what allows everything to do everything else. And so we want to have this natural rotation in our upper trunk. We want um, to have our pelvis kind of rotate in their hips, flex and extend to propel us forward. So we need, it's the thing that connects us from our upper back to our pelvis and to our legs is the core. And so we absolutely need it when we run and we, this is where we have to train what we do. So you can imagine when the arms are pumping while you're running and you're getting that natural rotation of your upper trunk, you have to train exercises that incorporate that movement or promote that movement, especially because we don't get a lot of upper trunk rotation in our day. Like it's just not part of our routine. We sit at a desk or we're only turning to one side or we're only carrying a kid on one hip. Um, And so we start to lose some of that upper thoracic mobility, I think a lot of times. And so having exercises that reinforce that, that bring that us back to that uh, is important. And I'm going to have a whole um, article written on different exercises. Like we're going to do one all about carry variations, all about plank variations, and different ways to incorporate the core. So stay tuned to it. I know I'm not answering this question fully, but it's because it's coming. And so hopefully, uh, moving forward, uh, Mike Mike can stay uh, tuned because I'm going to answer this more fully. Okay. So Alex, anything else from your article that you'd uh, like to touch on as we wrap up? I think the biggest things, and it's going to be kind of what we've reiterate over and over again is it's just learning what the basics are set your foundation and build from there so the foundation is learn to connect with your diaphragm learn to connect with your floor learn to connect with the front and the abdominals and the backside learn that all of them work together and from there you build your foundation to do everything else that you want to do and so um, it's first learning to appreciate them then recognizing there's a way to turn them on and incorporate it in your life and to connect with them. And then it's challenging them. And that's how you're going to build it up. 
Lindsay, do you have any uh, concluding thoughts? I think I mean, all of this information is great. And I think that the pelvic floor is like completely overlooked by so many healthcare providers um, and just people individually. And they learn to live with whatever, you know, they have going on. So I just, I think this information is great and we'll be able to help so many people. I just think that uh, the big take home, the, the things that I want you to like think about at the end, just that it's not that you can't work hard. It's just that you need to be able to know what actually is working rather than just putting your foot down all the time. Um, so if you do want to get better, it's not like you're just doing thought experiments and like sitting there quietly. So there are lots of pretty challenging things that you can do. Um, but you also have to be comfortable with maybe investigating some other things because there's going to be some exercises that we recommend that might seem unfamiliar to you, you know, or we might recommend that you spend your time doing different exercises than the ones you are traditionally used to. And can I have so, one more thing? Sorry, just yeah, to build course. off that. Remember, and it's just bringing it back to the pelvic floor one because it is maybe the more taboo topic here. I call it the performing enhancement muscle group. It is like the secret weapon for so many of my high level athletes that totally makes the difference in how much weight they can move, how much, how certain athletic activities, like with my gymnasts, with my baseball players, getting them to throw faster. Like it is amazing what it can do. And it is just a muscle group like anything else. Get more muscles on board with what you're doing and using them up and timing them appropriately. And it just opens the door for many more things. So think of it as, as a performance enhancer and not this thing that is weird to talk about. It is just another muscle group. Fasting and pelvic floors endorsed by us. <laughs> the two yeah. performing enhancing things that you can take advantage of. So, and I have my own actually. Stay tuned for that. You got to wait a while though. I'm, I already have a plan to talk about, but it ain't next week. So uh, with that being said, we will finish this lengthy episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Let us know again if what you think about the length and you, my opinion on it, it well, our opinion on it, because we all agree, um, is the show will be as long as it needs to be, but we are trying to respect your time which is ironic as I ramble endlessly at the end of the show. <laughs> so, but um, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I'll be up next week and thank you all for listening and please spread the word. We're really trying to give back and do good work and give you as much information as you possibly could want. So, um, I mean, we're, we're all in with this stuff. So, um Please let just let us know what you can, what any better ways that we can help you. So, from my entire team, uh, I just want to again offer you the opportunity to join the the family, so to speak, our team here. And remember, you can get all that done at advancedathletics.com. You can read Alex's article. You can listen to the show. You can become a member. So then you can submit your questions. We also are having discounts when we launch the coaching store in the next week or so. And there's a lot of opportunity for to get yourself better, but also to contribute to the, the solution and help us get this information out to those who really need it. So um, we would love to have you uh, apart and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. So until we talk next week, remember to serve others, but pay yourself. Goodbye for now. Bye. Goodbye. The Fuel Move Recover podcast is a product of Advancing Athletics, LLC. You can follow us on Instagram at Fuel Move Recover and Facebook at Advancing Athletics. This podcast is funded by our members at FuelMoveRecover.com. Their membership is matched with free seminars on performance and wellness for underserved municipalities in Ohio and beyond. Come join the FMR family to improve your well-being while supporting others. The following departments and charities are the shout-outs of our patrons with Protect and Serve memberships. The Stark County Sheriff's Office, the Task Force Dagger Foundation, Veterans Outdoor Foundation, and the Woonsocket, Rhode Island Police Department.